The first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 24. Of David, a psalm. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of God of Jacob. Salah. Lift up your ha heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Salah. The second scripture reading for today is Mark 6, 14 to 29, the death of John the Baptist. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men to arrest John, bound him, and put him in a prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and a holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of Jesus, the baptizer, Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. God bless the hearing of these words to our understanding.
the verse from that psalm that has always stuck with me. It's verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. Now, part of the reason that sticks in my head is because 40 years ago or so, we sang a piece in junior choir based on those two verses. And those of us who stood at the back even created actions to go with them. They weren't official actions, and I don't think we were supposed to be doing them. But still, we created actions to go with them. But also, it sets a fairly high standard. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts who have not lifted up their souls unto vanity, who do not swear deceitfully. Thankfully, God not only asks us to do that, but God is also forgiving when we don't do that. Because we don't always have clean hands and pure hearts. We don't always say what we mean. We sometimes swear deceitfully. The writer of the epistle of James writes, For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. We put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us. Or look at ships, large that take strong winds to drive them, and yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot, pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as the world of iniquity. It stains the whole body. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. Brothers and sisters, this ought not be so. So, No, really, James, tell us what you think about the tongue. Speech is very powerful. Great orators can lift people to the heights of glory. Think of Dr. King. More recently, think of Barack Obama, who, yes, in his presidency, did not live up to the height of his hope. But nobody could deny his power as a speaker. Or in an earlier generation, a Kennedy or Pierre Trudeau. Great orators can excite people, can lift them up, can drive them to action. Great orators can also build up people, or they can break them down. Hitler was a great orator. Technically, rhetorically, he was a great orator. The Rwandan genocide was sparked by people who were able to use the power of speech to get people riled up and go out and kill their neighbors. Many, many years, the Jewish ghettos of Europe lived in fear on Good Friday because they had experience of the bishop preaching such a great, inspiring sermon that the people went out and celebrated the death of Christ by killing those they thought had killed Christ. Speech can be a wonderful tool. It can be a dreadful weapon. Very few things in life have one, one side to the blade.
Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in God's holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted his soul to vanity, who does not swear deceitfully. In the Gospels, Jesus is known to have said, Why do you worry about what you eat? That's not what makes you unclean. What you say. What comes out, what you say, what you express, how you live, that's what makes you unclean. So be careful about what you say. Take heed to what you say. Then, of course, there's the old lie we tell our children. Actually, I don't think we tell it as much anymore. I know I was told it many times. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Did any of us ever believe that to be true? I mean, when we're honest, yes, we would tell that as a way of, a low-level way of trying to deal with, with verbal bullying. But did any of us ever believe that to be true? Words can never hurt me. Some of the deepest scars I carry have nothing to do with sticks and stones. We have to be careful about our words. We have to be careful about what we say because it shapes our world, it shapes the people around us, it shapes how we view the people around us. We'll come back to that. But let's talk about Herod for a moment. And isn't this just a lovely story to include in the Gospels? Tell me what you want, I'll give you anything. Well, I want the head of John the Baptist on a head, on a platter. What a beautiful, nice, family-friendly story. There's a reason why instead of using the Gospel story for children's time, I use this. That Herod has John executed is attested to not only in the Gospels, but also in other writings from the period. That there was a man named John the Baptist who preached and was executed by Herod is known. Mark seems to add some extra details that only Mark knows. Which is unusual, because usually if Mark's going to adjust a story, he makes it simpler and more basic. He likes everything to happen like this. Bang, 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 bang. But Herod has arrested John, or has had John arrested. But he still respects him. As Mark tells the story, Herod has great respect, even awe or fear of John. In fact, when Jesus, the Jesus movement starts picking up speed, and this, John, Mark sets this story as a flashback, right after we hear about the disciples going out into the villages and the towns and spreading the good news. And he says, well, it must be John. This Jesus must be John, come back to life. Which chronologically makes no sense. John and Jesus, if we follow Luke's chronology, are about three months apart. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Usually that's interpreted that John, that Herod has married Philip's wife while Philip is still alive. Kings do what kings will do, after all. And Herodias has a grudge against Herod, not surprisingly, since, since John has apparently been talking smack about her, and she has a grudge against John and wants Herod to get rid of him. But Herod has this respect, this awe, this fear of John. Some commentators wonder, does Herod like to go to the prison and visit with him? 
Treat him as a bit of a counselor. The relationship is very unclear. But anyway, let's go to the dinner party. You know, we might as well get to the meat of the story. The dinner party is the one which is widely, widely envisioned in Western culture as Salome and the Dance of the Seven Veils. And as the story is told, Salome comes in and dances this very erotic, sensuous dance. And Herod, in a, so impressed, he says, I'll give you whatever you want. That's probably not what Mark is describing. Because it's quite likely that this daughter is 12, which really puts a creepy edge to the Salome story. It's quite likely that Western culture wanting to, because of that desire to make it seem mysterious and that oriental mystery, developed the Salome story as they did. That in Western culture, if they have a chance to sexualize something, somebody in culture will sexualize it. But whatever it is, Salome dances for Herod, and Herod is impressed and is moved to say, to swear an oath. This isn't just idle words. He's swearing an oath and says, whatever you want, I'll give you. So she goes to her mother and says, okay, I wasn't expecting this. What do I want? Which sounds very 12-year-old-ish, actually. What do I want? Herodias sees her opening. Tell him you want the head of John the Baptist. We know who really wants the head of John the Baptist in the story. It's pretty clear. So she goes in and says, this is what I want. When I read that part, I imagine the blood draining from Herod's face. Oh, dear Lord, what have I done? What have I done? Because even if he doesn't care whether John lives or dies, then that's unclear from the way Mark tells the story. Mark tells the story such that Herod may actually want John alive. But even if he doesn't care, even if the death of this man is just another event in the day, there's something horrific about that request. And the logical thing to do would be to find some way out of it. Like, uh, can't do that today, sorry. After all, kings will do what kings will do. But he swore an oath. He swore an oath in front of other people. Herod has talked himself into a place where there's no easy way out. Every other species, James tells us, has been tamed by humans. But no one can tame the tongue. Herod has talked himself into a place where there's no easy way out. And he does the dreadful deed. Well, he doesn't do it himself. He orders it done. And the platter comes in. And the daughter dutifully takes it to her mother, who was the one who really wanted John's death in the first place. But Herod gets there because he's not careful about what he says. Probably Herod couldn't... Who, 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 when making that promise, would ever expect that to be the request? I mean, give him credit. He's not expecting that something horrible like that's going to come from his promise. But Herod talked himself into the corner. Now, one commentator, a, a podcast I was watching this week, pointed out that we may not fully understand that because we live in a world where politicians make promises all the time. And some of them were promises we're quite happy they don't keep, if we're honest. And some of them are promises we really wish they would. The challenge being that what I wish somebody would keep 
Somebody else is saying, well, that was a stupid thing to say, and vice versa. So we don't really comprehend this idea of an oath being sworn by a leader who then feels compelled, not just obliged, but compelled to keep it. But that's what Herod feels. In an honor-based culture, to swear an oath and then not live up to it is a great shame. Which is why you have to speak carefully. It's why over and over again in scriptures we're told to watch your tongue. It's why Jesus says whatever we say is important. It's why James goes on and on about the evils of the tongue. We have to speak carefully. Because speech creates. In the beginning of our faith story, how does God create? God speaks the world into being. Speech creates. It creates reality. It shapes us. As people of faith, we're called to choose our words carefully. Because they shape us. Because they shape our reality. We're called to choose our words carefully because words do great damage. Words can uplift. Words can build up. Words can create wonderful things, but words can do great damage. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. The old lie. We're called to speak carefully so we don't talk ourselves into a corner. So we don't talk ourselves into a situation where damage is done, where people are hurt. There's a reason why we teach our children, or we try to teach our children, things that we don't always do well as adults. Stop. Breathe. Before you say anything, stop. Breathe. Count to ten. Because we know words matter. God calls us to speak out. But God calls us to speak out with care, with love, with the vision of the kingdom, and knowing how our words can help build up and recreate. May we all speak carefully. Speak lovingly, speak words that build up and avoid, as best we can, the words which break down, the words which wound, the words which kill. May God help us to tame the tongue, even if James says it can't be done. Amen.